Hey, it's Alex Radcliffe from Board Game Co. And today we're doing the top 10 next step board games. So, so what does that mean? So this is a video that was suggested doing my last live stream, my only live stream. I've only done one so far, but there'll be more. But someone suggested a list of, like, I think they asked it as a question, but it's a great list of what are the top 10 next step board games? You've You've played No Thanks, you've you've played Baron Park, you've introduced your friend to Century Gollum Edition and whatnot, you've perhaps you've played a little bit of Carcassonne, some code names. You basically, whether it's you, whether you're doing it on behalf of a friend or a spouse or a partner, whoever, roommates, roommates are great for games. But you've gone through a bunch of introduction games. By the way, you have great taste. These are all amazing games for what it's worth. Great choices to get someone into the hobby. There's a lot more, but that's not the point of this video. The point of this video is that these are gone. I'm going to put them off to the side here. What's next? What are you going to play next? What What is the next introduction level that you can take someone to where it's it's not so heavy, it's not so much of a gateway, it's something that it's a little meatier. If they've, they've gone past those intros, they want something a little more, and to be clear, those are still excellent games. I still enjoy every single one of them, but sometimes you want something a little more. Now, Board Game Geek, if you're not familiar, it does have a category called Weight, where you can look at a game and see what the weight class of a game is, as people have voted, to determine how complicated a game is. So, that's a good reference in general. But today's about my list. What's my list of, of games that I think are an excellent choice when someone has clearly started to appreciate games? Again, whether you or someone else, but they want something a little more. Now, this is a very hard list to put together. There were so many amazing options, so many incredible choices. I really had a hard time refining it down to only 10. And in fact, I'm going to cheat a little bit and kind of do 11 because I wanted to include a little bit of everything. Now, I didn't include solo games. My own personal experience has been that it takes someone a lot of time before they're really willing to engage in solo games. That's true for myself. It was true for a lot of people I've introduced, to introduced into the hobby. That solo games really require a larger level of commitment to this to this atmosphere or something, to the space, let's use the word space, space is a good word. Solo gaming is something that's a little harder for people to wrap their minds around. I'd rather just play a video game, and, and I hear that. And so I specifically did not include solo games on this list. But past that, we have cooperative games, we have more Ameritrash, more Euros. I didn't have anything super combat heavy, because again, using my own personal experience as a barometer, I find that... The more conflict games, games I love, such as Blood Rage, Innis, Cyclades, and whatnot, I find games like that, even on a lighter scale, tend to be a little bit... They tend to require someone who knows enough about what they're doing that they're not going to have a bad experience. They're not going to have a game where they are squashed into the ground. I, I usually wait until someone has reached a certain level before introducing them to that kind of game. Could be a great choice, by the way. It might be a great choice for you, for whoever you're suggesting, but for the purpose of my own personal experience, I've left them off this list. So, we have a little bit of everything. Let's start with the 11th game. What did I leave off this list? What did not make the cut? And to be clear, I'm cheating because I really, really wanted to include all 11 games. I started, I, I started with most of my collection, managed to get it down to around 23, 24 games, slowly cut down one at a time, and I really couldn't decide on the last 11. So, Technically, number 12 was Concordia. Concordia was the, the last one to before this one. But Istanbul, the reason it's not on this list, but I'm still talking about it, is because, realistically, I personally prefer Istanbul with the expansion. With the Cafe, the Mocha, Mocha, and Bakshish expansion, I haven't played the other one yet. But I think Istanbul core game is actually more in the gateway category. I think Istanbul core game is a game that I would introduce to people fairly early on because I, I think it's accessible enough and and honestly for me it's a game that wasn't enough until I played it with the expansion. So with the expansion I do think it earns its place in next step gaming or whatnot. It has more going on, more decisions to be made, more balancing of the various objectives you're trying to do, so I think it does fit in this list. But base game alone I think is more gateway game and, and Istanbul in the merging of those lists, I'll still go into it briefly, but in Istanbul, what you are doing is you are setting up the board variable, which I love variable setup in games, makes every decision, every game a different puzzle to be experienced. But you set up the board in a 5x5, five five, and the expansion can change that, but a 5x5 five five grid of various tiles, or maybe it's 5x4, again, the expansion changes things, so I don't remember exactly, but you set up in a grid of the various locations of the board, and then turn by turn, you move your person around the board to try to take different actions on those locations. But you're dropping off advisors on the way, and every turn, in order to take an action, you have to either drop off an advisor or pick it up. 
which means those first few turns are pretty easy. You're like, I got this. I know what I'm doing. But as you slowly spread across the board, you suddenly realize that you haven't thought through what your plan is to make it all continue to work as you explore the board. Because you're going to run out of those little advisors on the bottom, those assistants. You're going to run out of those assistants as you move around, and you have to figure out how to both move forward and backtrack in a slowly expanding and contracting grid that effectively turns Istanbul into a giant puzzle. I find the base game is a little more simplistic, gives you enough going on that it's great for a few plays, but it does lose its luster for, at least for me, versus the expansion really mixes it up, takes it up a notch, and makes it so that every single game is a lot more interesting, a lot more decisions to be made as you balance the different objectives, the different ways to score rubies in this game, because ultimately you need a certain number of rubies to win the game. I think Istanbul is an excellent game. It teaches fairly quickly. It teaches uh, fairly, fairly quickly. It's both fairly quickly. And I think that the Istanbul as a core game is a great game to introduce people to. And yet when you introduce the expansion, it kicks it up a notch, which makes it a great entry point to a top 10 list that technically hasn't started yet. From there, Let's go with Everdell, and Everdell is one that I've talked about a lot. Everdell is a game that I have definitely mentioned. I had someone recently mention that in many of my videos, many of these top 10 lists, I managed to not repeat things a lot, which I'm thankful for because I specifically try not to. That being said, I will not try not to if it's at the cost of picking something that is the right fit. It's just I specifically try to do different lists that don't have overlap. But that being said, Everdell does earn its spot on this list as being a game that I believe it is slightly too much for a gateway game. I believe it's slightly too much. It's visually attractive. It is incredibly appealing to look at this game and see what it has to offer. But introduce this to someone new to games and it might just be a little bit too much for them. It might scare them off as you try to balance what's going on because there's a lot going on in this game. There's worker placement, there's hand management, there's different phases of the game. The beginning of the game requires an incredibly tight fit of balancing different, uh, different actions in order to maximize your first season before you head into the next season. That first season is important. If you can squeeze two or three extra actions compared to other players, you're going to get a lot more done. But then as the game progresses, what started off as incredibly tight ends up expanding and you find that you can do more and more and now the game is no longer about what to do and how I can do things, but rather how can I maximize the, the potential bounty that has slowly expanded in this game. Everdell is just a drop too much for a gateway game, in my opinion at least. But as a next step, I think it's excellent. I think the, the board will visually, the board, the art, the, the giant tree you have up on the tail, on the table, not the tail, will will pull you in, will pull other people into this game. And yet the strategic depth is definitely there. And then, then you can add expansions as well to take it to a further level. Like Istanbul, I've heard a lot of people say that the base game kind of gets stale after a while. For me, I've played it a few times and I don't feel it's gotten quite stale, but I know people have that opinion and those expansions will definitely mix it up and there are a lot of expansions. So there's a lot of opportunity to take Everdell in its current form as well as to slowly but surely expand it out as you and your group potentially get bored with what's a, a fairly excellent game that plays well at 2, 3, and 4 players. I do recommend Everdell, and I think it's a great next step game. Next up from there we have City of Spies. City of Spies, which is another excellent, maybe we should make excellent the word of the day. I find, I find in these videos if I embrace a word, if I use a specific word that I think is excellent, then I can get away with repeating the same thing again and again. City of Spies is a delectable can I use that? I don't think so. City of Spies is a game that I would really recommend. Now, I wanted to pick One Night Ultimate Werewolf for slightly a traitorous element, because I think that's great. I think One Night Ultimate Werewolf is a great game. But I do actually end up pulling it out very much as a gateway game. I think it's accessible enough that I often pull it out with people who haven't played a game at all, ever. So I couldn't possibly include, include it on this list, but I did want a little bit of of intrigue on this list, a little bit of betrayal and backstabbery, and I think City of Spies fits that, that role very nicely. In City of Spies, you're playing as spies, basically, but you're trying to put various spies down the board to manipulate the setting so that you can win the best spies, because there's a whole bunch of scoring going on in the game, but the scoring is almost secondary. It's definitely there. It serves as a nice backdrop to the objectives you're trying to achieve. But the fun of this game isn't so much the scoring, that's just kind of an afterthought. The fun of this game is the fact that you're trying to... The scoring sets the objectives, it sets the, the goals of what you're trying to fight over, and then the real fun of the game is just fighting over those things, trying to lay down your spies in different ways that you can get 
the reward you want. You can get the prize you want, and, and that requires a lot of intrigue. It requires putting down a spy here and flipping over what their spy was to look at what their person was. And then meanwhile, you realize, well, if I correctly sequence these spies, then not only will I be able to successfully have the most strength in that area, but I'll be able to pull out their spy, possibly shoot that spy, and if I can correctly sequence this with a combination of clever moves, a combination of thinking through what you have, what you were likely to place down, and perhaps a few times looking at different spies by going to different board spaces that will allow you to do it, it makes you feel clever. And or, like, a little bit betrayed as your plans don't work out at all in your favor. It is a game that I have successfully seen players have a terrible first round, achieving absolutely nothing, and despite their opponents now having better spies to place down on the board, you can manipulate the board state in a way that you still succeed. This is a game that is far more about the, the cleverness of the different placements than it is about any form of absolute strength, or again, like I said, even about winning. It serves as a great backdrop, but the game is just about manipulation, backstabbery, and just getting enough moves in there that you really, throughout the course of the game, there'll be a few times that you completely out-manipulate your opponents, and that will be incredibly satisfying for you. At the same time, there'll be a few times that your opponents completely out-manipulate you, and you'll still manage to appreciate that. Which brings us to Bunny Kingdom. Bunny Kingdom is a game that almost didn't make this list. In fact, I kind of missed it. When I put together those 23 games, I kind of missed Bunny Kingdom on my shelf somehow, and then I... I added to the list. This is the one that bumped out Concordia. And I know, I know, a few of you feel betrayed. Bunny Kingdom is not a great... Whatever. It's not a great choice for this list. Concordia would have been much better. I know. I understand. I get it. But this is my list. You know, send me a link to your YouTube channel. I'll definitely subscribe as well. But Bunny Kingdom... Bunny Kingdom. It's a shame I don't edit. Sometimes I say things on camera that I wonder if it was a mistake. But it is what it is. Back to Bunny Kingdom. Bunny Kingdom is a great game that... Excellent. It's an excellent game that that has drafting. This is by Richard Garfield. Richard Garfield is the father of MTG. I believe there's someone else involved in that, but Richard Garfield, MTG. Bunny Kingdom has drafting, it has area control, and it has cute and adorable bunnies. This game has enough going on that, again, I wouldn't recommend it as a gateway game, which is inherently the point of this list, but I would recommend it as an excellent step up. The game is visually appealing, it is cute, it is fluffy, it's not actually fluffy, it's mostly hard plastic, but it's a game where you draft a hand of cards, and those cards will give you a variety of options. Do I want endgame scoring cards that are so satisfying because I'll score a ton of points, but they don't let me do things in the middle of the game? Or do I draft ter territory cards to slowly spread my bunnies across the board? Or perhaps different abilities like camps or castles, or cities, really not castles, cities, camps, different spots that will achieve or increase my ability to produce in this game. In the game, you're going to be scoring both through dominance on the board, both through producing in different area types, and the board placements will be super key. But as well as that, you can get a ton of points through those diploma cards, those end game scoring cards, that combined with the proper board placement, combined with achieving your objectives in the correct way, will lead to scoring, you know, basically the first round you'll score like 5 points, second round, just 4 rounds, second round you'll score like, I don't know, 12, 13, third round you'll be like 50 and that's a lot, and fourth round you'll score like 60 and congratulations, you're doing well. But then the end game scoring will kick in and you'll be at, you know, 300 points at the end of the game. It is an insanely appealing experience that gives you the tenseness of drafting. I think if you want a gateway drafting game, Seven Wonders, Sushi Go, those are all great choices. If you want a next level drafting game, well, I'd recommend Bunny Kingdom. From there, we have Five Tribes. Five Tribes is one that I also debated just how much it would be a gateway, but I think Five Tribes has too much going on in it for it to be a great gateway game. There's a little too much to balance in this game. There's a little too much in terms of the genies on the board, the various Mancala elements of the board, although Mancala is really what makes me think it is a gateway game, but every turn, it's basically it's Mancala, let's start with that. This is a great next step because it comes with the basic premise of Mancala. You set up the board in a grid, various spots, again, very variable, every game will be slightly different in the way things play out. Not as impactful as Istanbul because there are more duplicate actions, but it'll still have a very, it'll still have a puzzle you have to figure out each time. Then you'll put a bunch of meeples on the board, this game is chock full of meeples, and then from there you Mancala it up. You grab a bunch of meeples, you drop them off along the board one at a time, and then you take the action of the final space you're on, but more specifically you take the action both of the color of of the meeple that you ended with, as well as the specific tile you are on. So you have to kind of match up which combination of actions am I going for? Do I want to take a green meeple action on this specific tile, which will let me buy a genie? Or do I perhaps want to take an assassin action, which will let me kill this guy and then take control of that tile, while also taking control of this tile, and will let me do whatever, marketplace buy? There are a lot of options in this game that make it 
a little more complicated than your standard gateway, a little bit more AP prone, and that's analysis paralysis, a little more analysis paralysis prone, a little more thinky than a typical gateway, and yet it's not so much that, it's not too complicated that I think it's out of the realm of a good solid next step game. Again, this game has beautiful artwork, beautiful production. It's one that I think in general, in general, I think when you're introducing people to both gateway games and next step games, I think the better looking a game is, the better it'll be because you're still selling people on this hobby to an extent. And, and while over time you will learn to appreciate just how incredible different games can be no matter what they look like, at the end of the day, looks matter. First impressions matter. And so very, for most of these games, I, I did pick games that look visually attractive. And Five Tribes is no exception. But in any case, Five Tribes is my favorite Days of Wonder game. And it's one that I definitely think is worth looking into. Next up, we have something a little bit different. And that is Chinatown. Let me just take the stack of boxes here. Chinatown. So now we have Chinatown. Chinatown is something that's a little bit crazy. And by a little bit crazy, I really mean a lot crazy. This is a great game that, mechanically speaking, can be a gateway game. And I almost debated leaving it out for that reason. But I think that the chaos in this game and the sheer amount of yelling and screaming you'll be doing in a short time frame with each other, I think it's a little too much for a gateway game in terms of the strategic understanding of what, of why you're yelling at each other and for what. Chinatown, at its core, is pure negotiation. This is a game that... Just for the sake of the game, it gives you every round, it gives you a few types of shops you can build on the board, and it gives you a few random territory controls, so that the course of the game you're building up these various types of shops that you want to acquire in sets, it gives you various spots on the board where you're going to be trying to build your shops, and then it says, hey, trade with each other. And what proceeds next, what happens next in this game is, is minutes and minutes of just frantic yelling at each other while you desperately make deals that will further your own interests, potentially further someone else, but then the further ahead you get in the game, the less people want to barter with you and trade, but they might need to because it might be their only possible shot at actually getting a win in this game. It is pure panic, it is pure yelling, it is pure... I was going to say frustration, but I guess that would make it a bad pick, but it can be frustrating. It is a game where I highly encourage the use of a timer doing these negotiation rounds. Well, in most games I don't like a timer. The problem is, as much as I love Chinatown, as much as I think it's a great choice, the one downside is, purely hypothetically, you can math out the perfect trade every time. You can math out exactly what optimal trade and who's getting the better end of the deal and what to do. So I think having a timer on the table takes takes that element of perfect information off the table, which makes Chinatown all the better. And next up from there, and this is one that I might get pushed back on, we'll see, is Parks. Now the reason I say I might get pushed back on Parks is because there are at least 14 people right now staring at the camera, or perhaps just listening, who said Parks? Parks is the next step game? Parks is a gateway game. That thing teaches in two minutes, it's beautiful, which you just said is important. Why in the world is this a next step game and not a gateway game? And I hear you. I do. I mean, I, I just argued your point for you. I definitely hear you. Parks is incredibly cutthroat if played right, at least in my opinion. And Parks shines with, when it's incredibly cutthroat. I think playing Parks as a gateway game doesn't let you really fully understand the level of, of just sheer screwage this game can give you. I think if you introduce this to someone who's new to games, they will understand the sequencing of the actions you just told them, but they may not fully realize the potential of this game, the potential it delivers. Now, granted, I'm sure there are a lot of people who like it as a lighter game, and that's great. And for them, it might be a gateway game. For me, Parks is intensely strategic. It is a game where you sit there and you optimize your actions. Ultimately, in this game, you're just moving your hikers along a trail to basically visit parks and trade in sun and trees and water to acquire those parks or visit those parks or whatnot. Along the way, you collect gear, and it's, it's really pretty basic. In fact, I read the rules and debated trading it away because of how basic it was. Yet the, the, the reviews out there and the positive opinions out there kept it on the table for me. But at the end of the day where parks shines for me is the level of screwage in this game, the level of planning your hiker's moves, not just in a way that benefits yourself, which is important, you should always try to benefit yourself, but also in a way that you, maybe you just plant your hiker down in a spot, forcing other players to either flip their campfire or skip it entirely. And then meanwhile, you move your other hiker along the trail, knowing that you are on the key spot that's stopping other people. And just when someone else has given up, you, you move forward, right when they have, right at the point where they've given up, they've planned out their other moves, they flip their campfire, and you're like, you know, go ahead, take that. 
There is so much manipulation of the board state, manipulation of how you move your hikers along these paths, that I think Parks shines when you have a little bit more gaming under your belt, when you have a little more understanding of the different elements and the significance of their actions, because you've played a bunch of games. I think Parks is likely a pretty decent gateway game. But I think if you hold off and introduce it to someone when they know a little bit more, I think Parks will shine significantly more. Which brings us to Margraves. Margraves of Valeria. Now this is really a twofer. Again, I'm just trying to sneak whatever games I can in, in here. Valeria Card Kingdoms is a great gateway game, at least in my opinion. I think Valeria Card Kingdoms is not a next step game, not by any means. It is very clearly a gateway game by, by every standard because it's it's so easy to teach. It's visually appealing. It's art by by, by Maiko. Is it Miko? I, I keep getting, I'm not sure really. But either way, it is a game that I think is an excellent, excellent... There you go, excellent again. I think it's an excellent gateway game that is easy to teach, satisfying to play, and I highly, highly recommend it. But we're not talking about gateway games, so why are we talking about Villages of Valeria? Or Valeria Card Kingdoms, wrong game. Valeria Card Kingdoms. And the reason is because I think Margraves is an excellent next step game. But I think Margraves will be so much easier to get to the table when you have someone who has Valeria Card Kingdoms under their belt. Because it has that common art, the common world, and I think that pulls people in. People like sets. They will often collect sets when they shouldn't because they want a full set of a game. And even though these two are bad, I like those four and I want to have a full set of my shelf. So it is what it is. But I digress. The point is that someone who has played Valeria Card Kingdoms and liked it is that much more likely to be intrigued by another game in the series. And that game should be Margraves. Margraves of Valeria is the next step up from Valeria Card Kingdoms, which again is the point of this list. In Margraves of Valeria, you're going to be managing a bunch of things you didn't have to in later games. You're going to be managing a shared pool of soldiers that are going to be moving around the board, but it's everyone has those soldiers, not just you. You're going to be building up a deck and trying to escalate on these different tracks throughout the game and balancing how to move your Margrave around the board and how to build different outposts or ward towers on the board. There is so much going on in Margraves, but it builds off those core concepts that you found in Valeria. It builds off the symbology and the artwork that you found in Valeria. It builds off different elements in that game, introduces new ones along the ways, and I think I think Margraves is probably the least well-known game from all the ones I'm going to be talking about today. Margraves is really an under underrated. Is underrated even a thing? I sense the topic for another video. Can a game be overrated or underrated or not really? We'll talk about that another time. Which brings us to my next game, which is Tack. Tack, Tack, Tack. Tack is my two-player pick for this list. I debated a lot of options for a two-player game, and many of these games do play well with two players, to be clear. But Pack is Tack, not Pack. Tack is the one that I would most pick from this list as an amazing, amazing, excellent game. It is a pure abstract strategy game. There is no theme around this game. It's it's pulled from Patrick Roth's uh, ser book series, which is, I can't remember the name of it, but something in the name of the wind or something like that. There's a book series by Patrick Rothfuss that this is pulled from a few pages of that book. Now, in this game, in TAC, what you're basically doing is it's basically a, a, you set up a grid, you put your pieces down, you're trying to get your pieces to connect from one side to the other. That's it. You have to put your pieces down one at a time, connect from one side to the other. It's a game system, a game mechanic that we've seen in a lot of games, but TAC quickly escalates. You first teach someone that basic idea of connecting one side to another, then you play it out. But then you realize you can place these other stones down on the side so they block other players and the game escalates. And then you get your cap, your capstone, I think your cap piece or whatnot, that can then squash other stones and knock them back down. And again, the game escalates. You teach the rules one at a time. You teach the sequencing one at a time. And the strategic depth of this game is absolutely insane. You will find it is best to play this game with someone who's learning along with you because you can kind of escalate together. You can kind of grow together and learn each other's moves together and figure out how to next take it to the next level where you can do some sort of amazing move that's going to set you up for a perfect win the next turn. TAC is an incredible strategy game that, in my opinion, if introduced as a gateway, you may not be able to fully appreciate just how much there is going on in this game. But if you wait until someone learns a little more, similar to Parks, if you wait until someone has a little bit more under their belt, then I think TAC will shine over there. And next up, we have Glenmore. Glenmore. The boxes on this table are starting to get a little bit out of hand. Let's figure out what we can do there. Glenmore is one that is a tough one for me because Glenmore is a pretty simple game. The basic idea of the game is simultaneously as simple as it is appealing. In Glenmore, what you are doing is you're going to be focusing on this mechanic, this interesting idea that you won't necessarily see in a lot of games that 
It's not about taking turns. Rather, whoever's furthest behind goes next. So you have this interesting thing, and this is something we saw in Patchwork, which of course you know because you've played that as a gateway game, which is excellent. Again, good choice. You have really good taste. But in Glenmore, in Glenmore, what you're going to be doing is you're going to be moving your guy around this little rondelle, almost not really a rondelle in typical sense, but a circle, even going around, and then you take the tile that is on that next step. And then you add that tile to your tableau, and you activate every single tile that touches, which means you're building this escalating tableau that will get progressively more powerful as you add more and more tiles to that tableau. But the problem is you have to balance what tile do you want to add? Do you want to add the one that's most closely in front of you? Or do you want to add one that's a little bit further ahead? Understanding and knowing that by doing that, you are letting the player behind you take multiple turns in a row. Now the game does compensate for that for a little bit because at the end of the game you will lose points for having too large a tableau compared to other players. But if you can build the right pieces, if you can build your tableau efficiently, that won't matter. So you're constantly forced to choose between taking what's best versus taking more, but giving up a tile that someone else might get to first. There are hard choices to be made in this game, but despite that, the game is actually incredibly simple. I can teach someone this game in five, maybe ten minutes, and we can get started. And then from there, the nuance will develop as you play, and again, the game will grow with you because it has chronicles in the box. It has, it has these, that's the name, Glenmore Chronicles. It has these chronicles in the box that add various expansion modules that you can add to your game to let the game grow with you. Because much like... Istanbul, and much like one of these other games, Everdell, to a degree, if you play the base game alone, it will slowly get a little stale with you, which is great that it comes built in with those expansions so that you are ready to go. Which brings us to the last game on the list. The last game on this list, and this is one that I... Ugh, this is one that I talk about a lot. I talk about Kaman a lot. I talk about Zombicide a lot, but... If you, I technically have a review, sort of, somewhere, maybe comparing it to Cthulhu Death May Die. And I debated between picking Cthulhu Death May Die or Zombicide for this last title. And the reason I went with Zombicide is because I think Cthulhu Death May Die is slightly my preference in terms of which game I would have picked mechanically. But I think thematically, Zombicide is more of a well-known or universally appealing theme than Cthulhu. And I'm sure a lot of Cthulhu people would disagree, but that's okay. Because I'm talking about the general public. What What is your random friend more likely to identify with? Zombies or giant tentacle elder gods that are slowly taking over the world? Either way, the point is both these are excellent choices. But why do I think Zombicide is such a great next step game? So to begin with, I don't think it's a good gateway game. Same premise. I think as a gateway game, there's a little bit too much going on here. And in fact, in general, I would be wary of introducing people to games that have a lot of miniatures on the board and fighting giant dragons while you introduce equipment and whatnot for some that might be incredibly appealing and that might actually make it an excellent gateway game but for others they might be a tad scared off by the idea that grown adults are fighting giant dragons on their table for some again no judgment no judgment here i'm i'm into it but i i definitely you know i personally definitely have some friends that wonder why i had a giant joan of arc dragon on my shelf so so that's a factor but as far as the next step game, I think Zombicide is an incredible experience that allows you to feel like you're just going to have fun. You start with six characters on the board, and there's always six. You could divide up amongst the number of players. I personally prefer Zombicide with two or three. I do not recommend it with six at all. And even four is tough because of, tough because of the division of six by four is harder. So I really recommend this with three players, perhaps two. And that's also relevant to the downtime, because you don't want to introduce a lot of downtime to this game, because this game is not fun if you are taking one action out of every six people at the table. It's a cooperative experience where you are fighting hordes of zombies and taking them down, and you will be fighting hordes of zombies and taking them down. The only question is whether you will eventually be overwhelmed by those same hordes. Because in the beginning of the game, you start with core weapons, basic weapons that can barely ever kill a zombie. The good news is in the beginning of the game, there aren't actually many zombies on the board. But then every turn, while you are slowly exploring rooms, picking up new equipment, getting better at the game, leveling up your heroes, getting additional skills that will help you survive, slowly but surely the number of zombies entering the board escalates. And escalates. And escalates. And before you know it, you have two or three heroes that thought that they would reluctantly, let's forget two, three, you have two heroes that thought that they were safe to wander off on their own to one corner of the map, but meanwhile there's an abomination in their face, perhaps there's a few wolves if you get Wolfsburg, which I do recommend Wolfsburg a lot, and this suddenly your heroes are facing death. And the question now is, do you sacrifice a hero to try to run away? Do your other heroes try to make their way across the board to save them? Do you even have a shot? Or are you doomed to repeat the same scenario again 
and this time make better decisions. Don't open up that door when Eric shouts not to. Listen to Eric, he's a good lad. I think Zombicide is an incredible experience which gives you that that epic leveling up D&D &D feel without actually being D&D &D because some people like Dungeons and Dragons and some people don't like RPGs, but either way, it will give you that feel, it will let you build up your characters, level up, and have fun with a game that will let you just kill 15 zombies in a single turn because if you last long enough, if you survive long enough, you'll get these incredibly powerful skills that will finally turn the tide of battle and let you destroy hordes of zombies and it will feel like a movie. Win or lose, it will feel like a movie where you made it to the end and you either won by the skin of your teeth or you got slaughtered because you didn't understand that dead eye walkers can shoot you from three spaces away and now you're dead. If you do pick up Zombicide Black Play, give the game a shot. I do think you'll enjoy it. Well, it depends on who you are, but you might enjoy it. And after that, if you do, then what I recommend picking up next is Wolfsburg. It gives you a lot of wolves and those wolves are a lot of fun. It gives you additional campaign missions, additional options, a tower element. And then from there, Dead Eye Walkers, a few abominations will increase your variety of maybe a hero pack. There's a lot going on in Zombicide. And if you like Zombicide Black Plague, there's also Zombicide Green Horde, there's Zombicide Invader. We have Zombicide Season 2 coming out. There are so many different options, although Black Plague is currently my favorite. So, I hope you enjoy this list. There were a lot of games that I wanted to pick for this list. And these are the ones that made the cut in the end. This is by no means the definitive list of the best possible. There are so many that I missed. And in fact, that's usually the part of the video where I ask you, what games would you have picked? You, whether it's yourself, well, I guess for yourself, you can't. Whether for a friend, if it's for a friend, you've introduced them to gaming, they've played whatever gateway games you think are amazing, excellent, ex whatever. What do you feel have been good choices that you started introducing, to, introducing them to after gateway games? And that resonated with them, that really gave them the gaming experience, the next step up that we're all looking for. And if all, if everything I said wasn't enough or whatever, and you do really want that combat game I mentioned in the beginning, if you do really want to like punish other players and smack them into the ground, I just, you can't go wrong with Blood Rage, Kemet, Innis, and Cyclades. Those tend to be my four picks that I really just highly recommend as incredibly engaging combat experiences that will be immensely satisfying if you enjoy that kind of thing. Until next time, I am Alex Radcliffe from Board Game Co., you can subscribe to this video. I have a top 10 list coming out every week. I do a lot of Kickstarter roundups where I talk about some of these games. And some of these games are Kickstarter games. Actually, far fewer than my usual list, which should be a reminder that Kickstarter is great, but it's only a small portion of my collection. Until next time, I'm Alex Radcliffe from Board Game Co. And I hope you have a good one.